Before I start, could I say a word of thanks this morning to all who have been praying for me, not only over the past few months, but especially over the past few days. And some of you will realize this week has certainly proved more challenging and stressful than I had anticipated. So thank you for your prayers. Thankfully, I've made it to heaven. <laughs> My lecture, I mean. Hopefully the afterlife and heaven itself can wait, a while longer at least. I want to say a special word of thanks to my colleagues, particularly my colleagues in the Old Testament department who have shouldered extra responsibilities during my study leave and my preparation for these talks. Also, a sincere thanks to my New Testament colleagues, all of whom have assisted me in one way or another, especially as I struggled with that difficult and complicated issue of judgment in relation to works. Uh, they're not guilty, by the way, of anything I said. Uh, thanks especially to Simon Gillam, uh, he has helped me a lot in the preparation of these PowerPoints that you're enjoying. Uh, he showed me how to do it, and not only did he show me how to do it, uh, he's running them uh, from the control room, which is great. Uh, so thank you, Simon. Thanks too to our library staff. Uh, we have a really tremendous resource uh, in our library. It'll be even better soon when we've even more books uh, on site. But I do owe Julie a lot of thanks for the way that she quickly ordered books for me that I needed urgently for my research. So thank you to Julie and the library staff. Uh, I'd better also publicly thank my wife for her patience and support. She alone knows just how challenging the last six months have been uh, at various times. But finally, I want to thank God for the way that he has shown me kindness and proved his faithfulness. Quite often, I let him down, but thankfully, God never fails. Thank you, too, for all your questions. I apologize that I've ignored some of them. I tend to ignore the ones that I think I've already covered in a lecture or will cover in a forthcoming lecture, uh, or questions that uh, I think you're just expressing disagreement with me, in which case, listen to the lectures over again. And if you disagree with me, if you disagree with me, I don't care. <laughs> but as I said, the very first lecture, what you really need to do is you need to read the Bible. Uh, look at those texts that we've been looking at and see what Scripture is saying. It doesn't matter what I say, it's what the Bible is saying that really counts. So thanks for your questions. Uh, my wife has had to remind me a few times when I got a bit frustrated during the last few days. Uh, a few times I expressed the sentiment, what do these people think I'm doing all day? <laughs> uh, and had it not been, uh, I was sort of busy doing other things, I would have had more time maybe to uh, interact with your questions, but my wife had to remind me that this interaction is a good thing, and it shows me that you're engaging with what I'm saying, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so as usual, I've selected the questions that I can answer. <laughs> Uh, is conditional immortality a legitimate alternative to the traditional doctrine of hell? It depends what you mean by legitimate. Before preparing these lectures, I would have had my doubts about its validity in terms of exegetical arguments. While I still don't agree with many of these arguments or the conclusions that are drawn, I think that in some places they have presented a reasoned defense of their position, and I think that we should at least uh, look at their reasoned defence and interact with it intelligently. But if you mean by the question, should we cast aspersions on the evangelical credentials of those who hold to the conditional immortality, or write them off as lefties or even jelly cats, or whatever you want to call them, uh, my, my answer is no. These are clearly people who are trying to understand scripture and are not denying traditional ideas because of current social climate or whatever else we want to suggest. Uh, they are not people who have gone soft on hell. Um, second question, each position has texts in its favor. Uh, which texts should we prioritize? I think that's a great question. Uh, that's what I wrestled with, uh, and I guess what everyone who reflects on this issue seriously must wrestle with. My answer for what it's worth, is prioritize the texts that simply will not fit into any other scheme. Those are the texts that I want to prioritize, the ones that won't fit into any other scheme. Uh, obviously, if there's only one such text in the, entire, in the entire Bible, that would not be good exegetical practice. You don't defend a doctrine on the basis of one text. But in this case, I think whatever position one adopts, this is probably not the case. There are more than one text to, to look at. 
It seems to me that there are some texts that simply cannot be made to fit any position except the traditional concept of hell, but obviously others will have their own opinion on that. Uh, two books I'd recommend you read. I'm not recommending, uh, I'm not saying I agree with these books, I'm saying that they're worth reading. Uh, this one, the most recent Four Views on Hell, uh, it's very good. Uh, you can read through it quite quickly. Uh, and what I like about these books is that each of the contributors get to bash at the arguments put forward by the others. So you get a very balanced uh, overview if you look at one of those kind of books. And so that's the, the most recent edition, uh, the 2016 edition of Four Views on Hell. Uh, it covers, um, interesting, the first edition uh, covered uh, a literal take on the traditional hell and a metaphorical take on the traditional hell. In this book, there's no literal take on the traditional hell. So that shows you that even the conservatives have moved ground uh, in the last 20 years. Um, but the other views represented are the annihilationist position. Um, interestingly, again, the guy who defends that is now, uh, I think it's the principal or whatever they call it, in Regent Vancouver, uh, who took over from J.I. Packer. And J.I. Packer is well known for his defense of the traditional doctrine of hell. So his successor is uh, a leading uh, conditional immortalist. Uh, the fourth view is um, purgatory, as I said the other day, defended by an evangelical. The original one had a, a Catholic defending purgatory. Uh, 20 years later, it has an evangelical Protestant defending the idea of purgatory. So that shows you again there's been quite a shift there. And then the, the fourth view uh, is uh, Parry's view uh, that we'll look at today, evangelical universalism, which wasn't in uh, the original either. Uh, this book, uh, I'm certainly not recommending this book as read this here to, to see what you should believe. But uh, what's really valuable about this book called Rethinking Hell is that uh, They've gathered together all the seminal articles by terminalist uh, authors. Uh, so if you want to see what John Stott actually said uh, without reading a whole book, if you want to see what Fudge says just reading a seminal article and so on, you, and, and the guys that influenced these guys, because the influences go back to the early part of the 20th century. So if you want to get a good overview of where conditional immortality is coming from, this book gives you it all in one book rather than having to chase down various articles here and there, or books here and there. So uh, I recommend have a look at it. I don't agree with it, but certainly you'll see where they're coming from, and uh, you'll get a much better perspective on their view of scripture, uh, which is not a dodgy view of scripture. Um, can Christians rejoice in the prospect of hell for those who oppose God, for God's enemies? Certainly not. God is grieved over the death of the sinner, and how much more is he concerned over their eternal death, however you understand that. Such a prospect should give us very heavy hearts and prompt us to pray and prompt us to evangelize. And I think all these viewpoints would agree with what I've just said. Uh, fourthly, and finally, uh, what do we make of God allowing sin to exist even in a cordoned off part of the new creation? Another good question. Maybe we can return to that one after this lecture. I'm not sure that I've got an answer to that one, but perhaps someone here does. And if you do, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Somewhere in outer space, God has prepared a place for those who trust him and obey. Jesus will come again, and though we don't know when, the countdown's getting lower every day. As a child, that was one of my favorite Christian courses. We sang it often at kids' clubs and scripture classes. For those who may recall, i.e. those my age or thereabouts, Countdown, that's what the name of the song, Countdown's popularity was undoubtedly due to its introduction. An actual countdown from 10. Nine, eight, right down to blast off. <laughs> and this was particularly exciting back then because NASA's Apollo program was in its heyday. So we were watching the real thing on TV, and then on Kids Club we were doing it. Ten, nine, eight, counting. <laughs> so this song had a, a very contemporary feel to it. Now you may be wondering what all this has to do with any with our topic this morning. Well, apart from the fact that it begins with a focus on heaven. 
somewhere in outer space. The theology expressed in its opening lines has been ardently denied in recent days, recent times, but not by biblical critics, not by theological liberals, but by evangelical scholars. Scholars who hold a very high view of scripture and who genuinely subscribe to its supreme authority for Christian doctrine. Tom Wright, for example, has scathingly critiqued the very premise of heaven as somewhere in outer space, or for that matter, the ultimate destiny of the people of God. Many Christians, he observes, grew up assuming that whenever the New Testament speaks of heaven, it refers to the place to which the saved go after death. Moreover, when they find Jesus talking about entering the kingdom of heaven, they suppose that he is indeed talking about how to go to heaven when you die. So Wright is clearly challenging the underlying premise of our song, somewhere in outer space God has prepared a place for those who trust him and obey. And as we'll see, there are a number of reasons for doing so. However, the, the latter part of that verse, that song, has also come under recent attack. Some within the evangelical camp have seriously questioned the idea that the hope of heaven is reserved for the few rather than the many. Or with regards to getting there, they reject the idea that there's any time limit involved. Evangelical universalists claim that such a hope encompasses everyone for whom Christ died, by which they mean the entire human race including even those who end up, albeit temporarily, in hell. So hell is thought of more as a kind of purgatorial wake-up call, through which defiant sinners are eventually brought to repentance and faith. And so in the end, hell will be emptied, and everyone, and I mean everyone, will enjoy eternal bliss. To borrow the words of Rob Bell, Love wins, or as Robin Parry would prefer, God wins. So then when we come to the, the topic of this final lecture, we're faced with at least two significant issues. One, how should we conceive of the ultimate destiny of the saved? And two, will everyone ultimately share in this experience? Those are the primary questions that we'll be addressing this morning as we consider heaven the ultimate destination, question mark. As usual, we'll approach our topic by examining relevant texts in the Old and New Testament, taking into consideration developments in Second Temple Judaism that may have a significant bearing on our understanding of the biblical texts. Now, last Friday, one of the questions that was put forward but quickly withdrawn was, was I not going to say anything about what the Jews thought between the Old Testament and the New about these matters? Well, if you've been at the lectures, you'll know by now that, uh, yeah, I've probably said too much about <laughs> that particular topic. <laughs> My wife has said to me a few times, uh, what are you bothering with all that stuff? Of it? <laughs> but hopefully it's clear why I am bothering uh, with it. But I don't think it's inspired scripture. I don't think it's authoritative uh, or anything like that. So then, uh, the concept of heaven and the future hope in the Old Testament the Old Testament includes 420 references to heaven, Shemaim. Uh, but these mostly refer to the sky and or to the solar system, rather than to a supernatural realm where God and other spiritual beings, i.e. angels, are located. Yet about 25% of the references to Shemaim do have in view the transcendent or heavenly realm. And many of these, together with the vocabulary associated with this heavenly domain, indicate that it was understood to be overhead, high above the physical creation. This correlates, of course, with the typical ancient Near Eastern understanding of a triple-decker universe. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to make out that slide. I enlarged it as much as I possibly could. But if you look carefully, uh, you'll see that there are, uh, there's the earth below, uh, Sheol, uh, then you've got uh, earth above, then you've got uh, various heavens uh, above that. So that's what I mean by a triple-decker uh, universe. Accordingly, heaven or God's dwelling place is perceived as far above us 
somewhere in or even maybe beyond outer space, as it were. However, other than the occasional visionary experiences of some Old Testament prophets, there's little thought in the Old Testament of human beings actually going there. The two extraordinary exceptions are, of course, Enoch and Elijah, both of whom were apparently taken by God in bodily form rather than undergoing the normal experience of physical death. But whatever implications this has for the concept of human survival beyond our earthly existence, the Old Testament nowhere presents the experience of Enoch or Elijah as a paradigm for others. These two cases were evidently considered to be most unusual, and interestingly, no explanation of their significance is provided in the Old Testament. There is an explanation in some of the intertestamental literature, but not in the Old Testament. It's true, nevertheless, that occasionally the godly appear to express some hope of continued communion with God beyond the grave. In some cases, however, the likely concept in view is that of being rescued from premature death or, if you like, an early entry into Sheol. We've already considered the conviction that Job expresses in that notorious difficult passage, uh, chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, so I'll not revisit that again. Suffice to say that Job is probably thinking of vindication before death rather than a post-mortem or post-resurrection experience. Again, apologies if that does spoil Handel's Messiah, but it ought not. Just think of it in terms, think of Job 19 in terms of an Old Testament type or shadow of a New Testament reality. The same may likewise apply to the convictions of hope expressed in certain Psalms. Most famously in Psalm 16, David expresses his confident hope in Yahweh's deliverance as follows. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be, be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. These words are picked up, of course, by Peter in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. But there they're applied as prophetic scripture to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Ultimately, ultimately, says Peter, this is what David was talking about. Not his own death and resurrection, but rather that of the Messiah, the descendant that God would one day place on David's royal throne. Even so, it was evidently David's personal circumstances that gave rise to what he says here. David is clearly confident of personal deliverance, whether from an untimely death or from the grim reality of Sheol that lies beyond that. Understood in the first sense, verse 11 simply anticipates the continued joy and lasting pleasure of communion with God in the present life. Understood in the latter sense, there's arguably a hint of some form of ongoing fellowship with God beyond the grave, or perhaps more accurately, beyond the resurrection. In either case, however, such a prospect is clearly not anticipated for everyone. It's for God's holy or faithful one, one who acknowledges Yahweh as Lord, verses 2 and 10. By contrast, those who run after other gods will suffer more and more, verse 4. While clearly referring here to the present life, the clear implication is that such suffering will inevitably end in death, unlike the hope held out here by the psalmist. The post-mortem fate of the righteous vis-a-vis -vis the wicked is possibly alluded to in Psalm 49. Here the psalmist wrestles with the issue of injustice in life, but he seems to anticipate a post-mortem resolution. The wealthy and powerful who oppress the righteous will be consigned to Sheol, verse 14, whereas the psalmist will be ransomed from there, and God will receive him, verse 15. What humans, however wealthy, cannot do, verses 7 to 9, God can and apparently will do for the psalmist. Now some understand this to be no more than rescue from imminent or premature death, but the final clause of verse 15 may indicate otherwise, especially if we read it in the light of Psalm 73, verse 24, afterward you will take me into glory. 
Indeed, in view of the issue addressed by the psalm as a whole, i.e. injustice in this life, something more significant than deliverance from premature death may be demanded. In any case, one thing is clear. The psalmist here is not expressing a hope that is all-inclusive. Like Psalm 49, Psalm 73 is another wisdom psalm that wrestles with the injustice of this life. And once again, the solution to the problem, namely the prosperity of the wicked, that's the problem, is found in in considering their final destiny, verses 17 to 20. Uh, this uh, This puts in sharp relief the present afflictions of the psalmist, who finds consolation in his ongoing relationship with God and all that that entails, verses 23 to 28, the eschatological high point may well be reflected in verse 24. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you take me into glory. Now, admittedly, that last line is a little ambiguous, as a comparison of standard English translations will quickly show. The key issue relates to the noun translated glory which can also mean honour. There's no preposition in the Hebrew, and therefore we have to supply one. But this can significantly impact our interpretation. Should we read to or into glory, or should we read with glory or with honour? In other words, does the psalmist envisage this glory or honour in the present life or in the afterlife? As Philip Johnson observes, the latter is strongly suggested by the use of the adverb afterward which most likely implies after death. Indeed, there would seem to be no other obvious reference point. In addition, the testimony of the psalmist in verses 25 to 26 might also lend support to the idea of a post-mortem hope. But once again, whatever hope of glory is expressed by the psalmist, it is clearly not one that is universal. Whatever we make of these expressions of hope in the psalms, It's beyond dispute that the main eschatological focus in the Old Testament was not enjoying God's presence in heaven, but rather enjoying the reality of God's presence here on earth. For the most part, God's holy dwelling place is envisaged as Mount Zion, where God is enthroned above the cherubim in the temple. It's not that the temple can in any sense contain God, as Solomon so rightly observes. Nevertheless, it's a place where heaven and earth truly meet. It's where God's presence on earth is made manifest and is supremely reflected. The temple, and before that the tabernacle, was simply a manifestation of heaven on earth, as it were. God visibly dwelling in the midst of his people. As several scholars have shown, both the tabernacle and the temple trace much of their symbolism back to the Garden of Eden, where God was clearly present with Adam and Eve. But it's not just the temple, it's the entire promised land that constitutes this new Eden. This is clear from how Israel's inheritance is depicted both in the historical past and in the prophetic future. Like Adam, Israel was placed in this new Eden by God and given special instructions, which they failed to fulfill, and thus faced similar expulsion, exile. This was not the end of the story either for Israel or for God's plan to bless all the nations through Abraham's seed, Genesis 12, verse 3. A new exodus, a new Israel, and a new covenant was promised, through which God's plan would be realized, and so the earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Admittedly, such knowledge of God does not necessarily involve a saving relationship, This is clear from Ezekiel's repeated insistence that Yahweh can make himself known to the nations in acts of judgment. Moreover, texts such as Isaiah 45 verse 23 arguably allude to the forced subjugation of defeated enemies rather than genuine repentance and salvation. Nevertheless, without question, the eschatological inclusion of the nations in the salvation of God is clearly articulated several times in both Isaiah and elsewhere in the Old Testament. However, as even Parry concedes, this hope is not universalist in the sense that it envisages the salvation of all individuals who have ever existed. Accordingly, in what is arguably one of the most significant Old Testament texts relating to our topic, 
namely Isaiah 65 and 66, the prospect of the new heavens and the new earth is clearly presented as non-inclusive. Sandwiched between Isaiah's graphic depiction of eternal bliss is a picture of furious judgment that, as we were reminded yesterday, leaves heaps of dead bodies in its wake. The utopia that Isaiah depicts in these two chapters is clearly not for everyone. But as perhaps we might expect, it is depicted not as some heavenly scenario beyond the deep blue yonder, but as an extraordinary earthly scenario in which sadness, and frustration, loss and misfortune, animosity and conflict, all these have been eradicated and people will live truly satisfying lives to ripe old age. Granted, death itself still features in Isaiah. In Isaiah's vision, it has not yet been destroyed, although the painful loss associated with it seems to have been removed. Obviously, Revelation 21, where this imagery is further developed, provides a fuller and more complete picture. So here in Isaiah, we have a photographic negative, as it were, a true but underdeveloped depiction of what God has prepared for those who love him. While the imagery should not be pressed in a woodenly literal sense, it's perhaps the closest we have to an Old Testament description of what heaven will be like. In keeping with the rest of the Old Testament, it holds out the prospect that the blessing on earth that Israel experienced in part will eventually be experienced in full, and not just by Israel, but by people of every nation. And I hasten to add animals. Uh, not resurrected animals, but animals nonetheless. <laughs> so far as the Old Testament is concerned, right and others would appear to be correct. I was going to say right would appear to be right, but that doesn't sound quite right. Sorry. <laughs> might even sound heretical to some. <laughs> what he's correct about is this, a metaphysical heaven is apparently not our eschatological home. But for all its emphasis on the eschatological inclusion of the nations, the Old Testament offers little support for the idea that this future utopia is going to be the ultimate destiny for everyone, including those who fall under God's wrath. Rather, those who fall under God's wrath are very clearly and very explicitly excluded in Isaiah 66. Not much changes in the intertestamental uh, period. While the intertestamental literature reflects the same range of meaning for heaven as that we saw in the Old Testament, there's certainly a much clearer sense of post-mortem separation between the righteous and the wicked. This is especially so in the case of apocalyptic material, although it's not limited to such. The oldest references to such a division are found in the earliest parts of one Enoch, in particular the so-called Book of the Watchers. That's the first 36 chapters of one Enoch. As we've noted previously, in chapter 22, the realm of the dead is apparently divided into four distinct parts, three of them dark and one luminous with a spring of water in the middle of it. Raphael, Enoch's angelic guide, explains that these hollow places are designed to house the souls of the dead until Judgment Day. The dark chambers are created for sinners, whereas the chamber with the spring of water is for the righteous. Obviously, the latter is not depicting their final state, but there's arguably a conceptual link here with the spring of the water of life associated with the new creation in Revelation 21. In any case, the final bliss of the righteous is described just a few chapters later, where in keeping with earlier statements in the book, it is depicted in terms of a, re a return to renewed earthly life. In chapter 24, Enoch sees seven tall and dazzling mountains made up of precious and beautiful stones. They resemble the, se the seat of a throne and are surrounded by fragrant trees, one of which stands out in fragrance and beauty from all the others. In chapter 25, Enoch's angelic interpreter, this time Michael, the archangel, explains what he sees as follows. This high mountain which you have seen, whose summit is like the throne of God, is his throne, where the Holy Great One, the Lord of glory, the eternal King, will sit when he shall come down to visit the earth with goodness. And as for this fragrant tree, 
No mortal is permitted to touch it till the great judgment, when he shall take vengeance on all and bring everything to its consummation forever. It shall then be given to the righteous and holy. Its fruit shall be for food to the elect. It shall be transplanted to the holy place, to the temple of the Lord, the eternal King. Then shall they rejoice with joy and be glad, and into the holy place they shall enter, and its fragrance shall be in their bones, and they shall live a long life on earth, such as your fathers lived. And in their days shall no sorrow or plague or torment or calamity touch them. Now here the correspondence with the final chapters of Revelation is impossible to miss. Like Isaiah 65, however, here in one Enoch, it's a depiction of an earthly paradise involving a long life. It may not be everlasting life, but it's considerably longer than the present one. And it's full of joy and free of misfortune. So like the Old Testament, one Enoch is depicting not people in heaven, but rather heaven on earth. But this will be enjoyed not by everyone, but only God's elect. In sharp contrast, the final destiny of the sinners will be an accursed valley, most likely an allusion to Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom. While, subsequently, sorry, while subsequent writings do not share one Enoch's more complex perspective on the division of the dead in the afterlife, several clearly maintain a sharp distinction between the fate of the righteous and that of the wicked. According to Jubilees, while the, the wicked will face eschatological punishment, the righteous can anticipate long and satisfying lives in a renewed heaven and earth from which evil has been eradicated and where God will dwell in their midst. Psalms of Solomon, so-called, contrasts the everlasting destruction of the wicked with the righteous rising up to glory or eternal life. This eschatological life that the righteous inherit is described as unending and everlasting, although what it entails is not actually specified. Perhaps the most extensive treatment of conditions in the afterlife is found in 4 Ezra, dating to the latter part of the first century, sometime around the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. As such, this text is more or less contemporary with some of the later books of the New Testament, such as 2 Peter, Jude, Revelation. Interestingly, as we noted yesterday, 4 Ezra raises one of the questions that we've wrestled with, whether, the div whether divine recompense takes effect immediately after death or only after a final judgment on the last day. As Ezra's question about this reveals, this was evidently a matter of some debate even back in the first century. The answer to this question, according to 4 Ezra, is both. Although a conscious intermediate state, at least for the righteous, appears to be rather short-lived, lasting only seven days. In any case, it's clearly presented as a foretaste of the final destiny that awaits the righteous and the wicked, respectively. To quote, the pit of torment shall appear, and opposite it shall be the place of rest, and the furnace of hell, literally Gehenna, shall be disclosed, and opposite it the paradise of delight. It may be tempting to interpret the fourfold description here in terms of the intermediate and final states. After all, both Hades and Gehenna, the lake of fire, do appear alongside each other in Revelation 20 also. Thus understood, the image might depict the pit of torment and the place of rest being vacated for the day of judgment, after which the wicked are cast into Gehenna and the righteous are welcomed into the paradise of delight. That's very neat, very logical. However, the parallelism in 4 Ezra arguably suggests that only two different destinies are on view here, namely heaven and hell. And this seems to be confirmed by the verses that follow. Then the Most High will say to the nations that have been raised from the dead, Look now and understand whom you have denied, whom you have not served, whose commandments you have despised. Look on this side and on that. Here are delight and rest, and there are fire and torments. Thus he will speak to them on the day of judgment. With these two prospects in view, the text is categorical concerning the fate of the majority. Now I see that the world to come will bring delight to few, but torments to many. For an evil heart has grown up in us, which has alienated us from God, and has brought us into corruption and the ways of death. 
and has shown us the paths of perdition and removed us far from life. And that not merely for a few, but for almost all who have been created. Again, the Most High made this world for the sake of many, but the world to come for the sake of only a few. Many have been created, but only a few shall be saved. Well, I think it's fair to say that the author of Fort Ezra was not a universalist. He viewed the day of judgment as decisive and the fire of Gehenna as all-consuming, so not even a smidgen of hope is held out to the reprobate. But to the righteous, the prospect envisaged is that of a renewed creation with paradise restored. It is for you that paradise is opened, the tree of life is planted, the age to come is prepared, plenty is provided, a city is built, rest is appointed, goodness is established, and wisdom perfected beforehand. The root of evil is sealed up from you, illness is banished from you, and death is hidden. Hades has fled, and corruption has been forgotten. Sorrows have passed away, and in the, di sorry, and in the end, the treasure of immortality is made manifest. It seems clear, therefore, that the, the, the major theological development that took place between the two testaments was a much clearer belief in a personal afterlife, involving a sharp distinction between both the post-mortem and the post-resurrection fate of the righteous and the wicked. Moreover, late first century uh, texts such as 4 Ezra utilized the concept of paradise to portray not only the present heaven, but also the ideals of God's new creation. And what we find in the New Testament is not dissimilar. As we might expect, the New Testament vocabulary for heaven is employed in much the same way as the Old Testament, denoting both the sky above and the physical universe, as well as the dwelling place of God and angels. The latter, however, is by far the most frequent connotation of the noun in the New Testament. Indeed, it's not just the place from which Jesus came and to which he subsequently returned. It's also where would-be disciples are urged to invest. It's where our citizenship belongs. It's where Jesus says our reward is located. It's where our future inheritance is kept by God. So in the light of all that, when Jesus describes his father's house as having many rooms, and then talks about going to prepare a place for, so that others may be with him, it's very easy to infer that our eternal home will be in God's celestial abode after all. However, it would be a mistake to jump to any such conclusion. The New Testament is very clear that Jesus is going to return from heaven, Acts 1 verse 11, when the time comes for God to restore everything that he has promised long ago through his holy prophets, Acts 3 verse 21. Moreover, talk of our investments, rewards, inheritance, or citizenship being in heaven does not necessarily imply that we're going to live there forever with God. Rather, these expressions simply highlight that our loyalties, our hopes, our values are heavenly, not earthly. That is, they're focused on God rather than being tied to the transient and false securities of this present world. So when Jesus promises to return to take us to the place that he has prepared for us, we should probably interpret that in the light of similar terminology applied elsewhere in the New Testament to the prospect that we traditionally refer to as heaven. Thus what we're going to do is consider the major concepts used in the, Old, in the New Testament to express this eschatological reality, beginning with one that was extremely significant for the teaching of Jesus himself, namely the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, as it's usually described in Matthew, is the key focus or overarching idea in the teaching of Jesus. What did Jesus come and teach about? The answer is the kingdom of God. Not surprisingly, therefore, it's also a key concept in the teaching of the apostolic church. It was understood by Jesus and the apostles as the fulfillment of Old Testament hopes and promises. Mark 1, verse 15. And thus the telos, the end towards which Old Testament scriptures pointed. <clears throat> However, while the New Testament announces the arrival of this long-awaited kingdom or divine rule in Jesus, there's clearly both a present 
and a future dimension. This is best expressed by the concept of inaugurated eschatology, that is, the last days anticipated in the Old Testament have arrived in the coming of Jesus, but they await full consummation when Jesus returns again in glory. Thus understood, Jesus has inaugurated the kingdom of God here on earth. The kingdom has indeed arrived, as the Gospels announce. But it's not yet manifest in all its fullness. For that we must wait for the day of the Lord, when the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Thus the kingdom of God is something we can enter now, and we do so by embracing God's anointed king by trusting in Jesus. But it's also something that we presently can anticipate, something flesh and blood cannot inherit, and therefore a prospect that we cannot fully experience until the future, when God's kingdom comes and God's will is done on earth, exactly as it is in heaven. Thus, as the Old Testament leads us to expect, this is no mere spiritual reality or otherworldly realm. Rather, this kingdom is a physical reality in which Jesus will eat and drink with his people and resurrected and glorified citizens will live in perfect submission to their God and King. But this is clearly not portrayed as an all-inclusive prospect. Matthew 8, verse 12. Indeed, not even all of Christ's professed disciples will enter this coming kingdom. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, which we looked at on Wednesday. Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, depart from me, you evildoers. And Paul himself lists various examples of impenitent sinners who are expressly excluded, who will not, who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Therefore, most evangelicals think of the kingdom of God in exclusive terms, at least in its consummated form. But evangelical universalists suggest otherwise, for they're convinced that death and judgment are not decisive, and therefore exclusion from the kingdom, even for those who end up in hell, is not God's final word. We'll return to the rationale for this conviction shortly. But for now, it suffices to say that unless we allow for the possibility of post-mortem repentance and escape from everlasting punishment in hell, the kingdom of God is exclusively, is exclusively for those who are considered worthy, 2 Thessalonians 1.5, on the last day. What's the same can be said about the related concept of eternal life or life of the age to come? While especially associated, associated with John's gospel, this familiar idea appears either explicitly or implicitly throughout the New Testament. Once again, it's something that Jesus has already inaugurated. As John's gospel emphasizes, Jesus came that we might have this life of the coming age right now, in the present. We can have, Christians can have the future now, as a 1980s UK car commercial once put it. It's now passe. <laughs> the car, I mean. <laughs> I think it was a Holden. <clears throat> oh, the UK equivalent. Anyway. Jesus, the very personification of eternal life, has brought the life of the future into the present. Through putting our trust in Jesus, Christians have this eternal life, this life of the coming age, the age to come. We have this life right this minute just as we have already entered the kingdom of God through faith. But it's clear that there's a similar present but not yet dimension to eternal life as well. Like the kingdom of God, the best is yet to come. Only when Jesus returns will we experience this life in all its perfection, in all its fullness. But this does not entail our removal from here, from planet Earth to somewhere else. Rather, just as Jesus brought heaven and eternal life to Earth, through his incarnation, so we will experience heaven and this life that is truly life, not in some ephemeral location in the heavens above, but rather here on earth, in a physical place where we will be physically embodied, our new bodies. But who is this we? 
Who is this we who can anticipate such a life in the age to come? Again, most evangelicals understand scripture to restrict this to those who grasp hold of this life now in the present age. Indeed, this is not surprising given that the corollary of eternal life is the ominous prospect of God's wrath remaining on us, which issues in death, perishing, destruction, and eternal punishment. For the universalist, however, such punishment is not fixed or final, as most others suggest, including advocates of annihilationism. Rather than understanding such punishment as lasting forever, Parry and Talbot emphasize that the Greek adjective ionios simply denotes pertaining to the age to come. They thus reject the idea that either the life or the punishment pertaining to the age to come must necessarily endure forever. In doing so, Parry and Talbot interpret the parallelism between eternal punishment and eternal life in Matthew 25 verse 46 consistently. And thus they avoid the standard objection that eternal must surely mean the same thing in both lines, everlasting life and everlasting punishment. Unlike many annihilationists, Parry and Talbot apply the same connotation of Ionios to both destinies that are envisaged here. Both the life and the punishment in view are simply those pertaining to the age to come. Thus understood, Matthew 25 verse 46 says nothing about how long such life or punishment may last. Although Talbot possibly alludes to the immortal character of the life associated with the age to come, when he describes it as a special quality of life, whose causal source lies in the eternal God himself. Parry, likewise, does not actually deny the unending quality of such life to come. He simply finds the exegetical basis for its indestructible nature elsewhere. He goes to 1 Corinthians 15, rather than Matthew 25. Thus, while both these scholars concede that Matthew 25, verse 46, might seem to undermine their case, for post-mortem repentance and salvation, they deny that this is the case once the significance of Ionios is properly understood. In response, we could point out that the scholarly consensus is that Ionios can and often does denote never-ending. Granted, this observation may cut little ice with those who are climbing out on a theological limb in the first place. But perhaps more significant is the fact that in Matthew 25, verse 46, and in numerous other New Testament texts, there's really no obvious reason to assume that Ionios means anything less than everlasting. Since the age in question undeniably does endure forever, it's only logical to infer that the same applies to both the life and punishment so closely associated with it. Accordingly, it seems fair to conclude that eternal life and its negative corollary, eternal death, does not really support a universalist understanding of heaven. The third and arguably the most encompassing concept of heaven in the New Testament is that of new creation. Once again, this is something that Christians already experience now in part. As Paul puts it, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Such is the significance of being born again, being born from above. It's through such regeneration that we receive the gift of eternal life and that we enter into the kingdom of God. But regeneration or new creation encompasses much more than individual Christians or even the people of God collectively. Jesus is alluding to something much more extensive when he anticipates the renewal of all things when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, Matthew 19, verse 28. This renewal or regeneration, palingenesia, to which Jesus refers is of cosmic proportions. It's apparently what Peter subsequently describes as the restoration of all things, Acts 3, verse 21. And what Paul undoubtedly has in mind when he speaks of creation being liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God, Romans 8, 21. In other words, it's a vision of cosmic redemption and salvation, 
articulated most plainly in the biblical expectation of a new heaven or heavens and a new earth. That is a renovated or restored creation. The fullest description of the latter is, of course, presented in the final two chapters of Revelation. They are drawing on a lot of Old Testament motifs. John describes a new cosmos, a new Jerusalem, and a new Eden. These, however, are not really three different places, but rather figurative descriptions of the one reality which we're referring to as new creation. But we'll look at each in turn. The new cosmos. John's description begins by drawing attention to a renovated or renewed cosmos, a new heaven and a new earth. This clearly heralds the fulfillment of the promise in Isaiah 65, verse 17, where this new cosmos is arguably portrayed in terms of transformation and renewal rather than destruction and replacement. Here in Revelation, John might seem to be suggesting the latter since he speaks of the first heaven and the first earth having passed away, 21, verse 1. When this is read in conjunction with the cosmic conflagration anticipated in 2 Peter chapter 3, it's very easy to infer that God intends to obliterate the present universe and to create an entirely new one. <coughs> However, this is almost certainly not what either Peter or John is suggesting. While Peter speaks of destruction using the image of cosmic conflagration, he is primarily describing the destruction of sin and corruption. Creation itself is not being eradicated. It's simply being radically cleansed or purified. Similarly, when John tells us that the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, he's not referring to cosmic annihilation or the dis dissolution of the universe. What he's alluding to is its radical transformation. Just as with the individual's new creation, so with the cosmic. The old has passed away and the new has come not in the sense of obliteration and replacement, but in the sense of purging and renewal. What John is describing here in Revelation 21 is creation renovated or renewed, a radical transformation, a new world order involving a newness in quality rather than a newness in time. As someone has put it, God is not making all new things, rather he is making all things new. And in this new or renewed creation, forever gone will be the chaos of evil, here symbolically represented by the absence of any sea. Now again, it's important not to misinterpret this. One of the things that my wife and I enjoy most each week is a trip to the seaside. We go on a short coastal walk by the sea, taking in the beauty and the magnificence of the ocean. I love it. A new creation without such would seem to me to be rather impoverished and maybe even disappointing. <laughs> but it's doubtful that John is even suggesting that here. The sea in apocalyptic texts is sometimes associated with the origin of cosmic evil, Daniel 7, 2-3. Most especially, it's a source of trouble, opposition, and death for the people of God, Revelation 13, 1, Revelation 17, 1 and 6. As such, the sea is arguably symbolic here, Symbolic of all that mars and ruins the present earth, especially for God's people. Indeed, verse 4 of Revelation 21 may very well unpack the metaphor. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What will be entirely absent in the new creation, John tells us, is anything that could possibly ruin or corrupt it. In particular, anything that would threaten the peace and joy of those who inherit this new cosmos, this new world order. The heirs themselves are the main focus of the next picture that John uses here in Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem. Contrary to what many have inferred, this is not a literal description of heaven as a place. Rather, it's a figurative depiction primarily of those who inhabit the new creation. This is strongly suggested by the twofold reference to the bridal imagery. 
Chapter 21, verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Verses 9 and 10, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The bride's, the lamb's bride has already been identified explicitly as God's holy people back in chapter 17, where she is similarly described as suitably attired for her husband. Identification of the new Jerusalem with the people of God may also be inferred from Revelation 3 verse 12, where Jesus closely identifies the new Jerusalem that's coming down out of heaven with the person who overcomes, i.e. the faithful believer. In any case, even a cursory reading of John's depiction of the New Jerusalem here in Revelation 21 should tell us that no physical city is being depicted. Leaving aside the idea that such, I was going to say such a monstrosity, but I better not say that, such a literal, a literal edifice might actually one day descend from heaven, just consider how it's portrayed. A perfect cube of pure gold with each dimension measuring 2,200 kilometers. A very high wall of jasper, possibly some 65 meters thick. Not one, but 12 pearly gates, each of them made from a single pearl. 12 foundations, each made from or possibly decorated with a precious stone. And of course, streets paved with pure gold. This splendid image has certainly proved inspirational, but not necessarily in the way that God intended. And the main reason for this is that it's been taken as a description of a place rather than as a depiction of its inhabitants. Taken as a highly figurative depiction of the latter, this passage tells us a number of things about the final blessed state. Most importantly, it tells us that we will experience and we will enjoy the presence of God himself. There's no need for a temple in this city because God himself will dwell there directly with his people or as some texts read it, peoples. Such is reinforced by the otherwise weird architecture of this amazing city. As a perfect cube of pure gold, it's clearly a hugely expanded form of the Holy of Holies, the most sacred part of the temple in the Old Testament. In other words, this entire city is portrayed as God's inner sanctum, God's dwelling place here on earth. The experience that we enjoy to some extent now through the indwelling Holy Spirit will be more directly experienced when the new creation is finally consummated. Then God will dwell with us and his glory will outshine the sun. This is a picture of heaven on earth, basking in the wonderful light of God's presence. The dimensions of the city and its walls, 12,000 stadia and 144 cubits, are clearly figurative, conveying the totality of God's people throughout the ages, similar to the 144,000 mentioned back in chapter 7 and 14. This is further suggested by the names of the 12 tribes of Israel that's, that are written on the city gates and the names of the 12 apostles written on the foundations of the city walls. As such, these numerical figures most likely provide assurance that in the new creation, all of God's people, all God's elect will be there, none will be overlooked, none will be excluded. However, the measurements of the city may also convey something of the consummate security and safety of God's people in the new creation. Not only is the city situated on a very high mountain, but its wall is so thick that no invading army could possibly breach it, and arguably so high that it could never be scaled. Moreover, standing guard at each of the city gates is an angel, more than a match for any human invader. But while all this imagery may suggest a secure place, remember John is primarily describing a secure people. His description speaks of their security, their safety, their protection. The figurative city gates... These are never shut because there's no night there. 
There'll be no danger, nothing to threaten, nothing to harm in God's new creation. Indeed, we're expressly told that no undesirables will ever enter this city, rather only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, chapter 21, verse 27. All others permanently remain outside, chapter 22, verse 15. Now, of course, evangelical universalists will vehemently deny what I've just said, i.e. that these others remain forever outside the city, forever exposed to God's wrath. Indeed, Revelation 21 and 22 is one of the key biblical texts that they draw upon to defend the idea of post-mortem repentance and escape from the lake of fire. Parry, for example, presents the following arguments. One, the overall trajectory of revelation, like the Bible as a whole, is salvation through judgment. That is to say, judgment is not and never is God's final word. Second argument, this pattern, judgment, climaxing in salvation, applies to both texts in revelation that might otherwise imply enduring punishment without any hope of redemption, namely Revelation 14, 9 to 11, and Revelation 20, 10 to 15. Third argument. In the book of Revelation, the saints are never identified with the nations who, together with the kings of the earth, suffer eschatological judgment in the lake of fire. These nations are nevertheless clearly part of this new Jerusalem. They will walk by its light, verse 24, and bring their worship into it, verse 26, and be healed by the tree of life, chapter 22, verse 2. Fourth argument, the permanently open gates of the city are not just a symbol of security, but primarily a symbol of permanent access, allowing the nations to enter, just as in Isaiah 60, verse 11, from which this feature is clearly drawn. Fifth argument, the pilgrimage into the city of such formerly unsavory characters as the kings of the earth demonstrates that the lost, i.e. those outside the city in the lake of fire, will avail themselves of the opportunity afforded by these permanently opened gates. And sixth argument, the 144,000 drawn from every nation are described as first fruits, Revelation 14, verse 4. This first fruits implies that the, the church is the first installment, and thus the nations here in Revelation 21 and 22 are the rest of the harvest that follows in the age to come. On the basis of these arguments, Parry thus concludes that there is a continuous flow from outside the city, namely the lake of fire, into the city, until eventually hell is emptied and everyone, and he means everyone, including Satan, is reconciled to God. Whew. While collectively these arguments may seem rather impressive, maybe they don't, a closer examination of each link in the chain suggests otherwise. We can certainly concede that the overall trajectory of Scripture is indeed salvation through judgment. After all, this is ultimately expressed in the atoning death of the Lord Jesus, which saves us from God's coming wrath. However, such salvation does not apply to those who end up paying the penalty for sin themselves. Either Jesus pays for our sin or we do. Thus, it's simply misleading to suggest that judgment is never God's final word. For those who die in their sin, this is indeed the case, whether in the Old Testament or in the New. As to the second point, a focus on salvation does not, or sorry, a focus, a focus on salvation does undeniably follow the focus on judgment in both Revelation 14 and 20. However, it does so by way of contrast rather than temporal or logical sequence. This is particularly clear in Revelation 14, where immediately after the threat of everlasting torment, perseverance unto death is very strongly encouraged. Accordingly, the punishment of those who worship the beast and the praise of those who are victorious over the beast are presented in these two chapters as polar opposites. The same is true in chapters 20 and 21. 
Indeed, an exhortation to persevere is at least implicit in chapter 21, verses 7 and 8, where the prospects of the errors and the non-errors are again sharply distinguished. Thus understood, the prospect of this holy city is not being presented as a future hope for the wicked dead. Rather, it's held out as an incentive for Christian disciples to persevere and to overcome during the present evil age, when obviously many will be tempted to do otherwise. As already noted, the same contrast between the heirs and the non-heirs reappears at the end of chapter 21, where entrance into the New Jerusalem is expressly restricted to those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Universalists, of course, adopt a non-Calvinistic interpretation of the Book of Life, contending that its contents are not fixed, they're not determined before time began. In other words, names can be deleted or added. However, even Parry concedes that Revelation 17 and verse 8, and possibly Revelation 13 and verse 8, seems to suggest that one's presence or absence from the book of life is determined before creation. That's a telling concession. If we accept the latter, it's very difficult to see how people can be consigned to the lake of fire because their names are not recorded in this book, chapter 20, verse 15, but later admitted to the holy city because their names are in this book after all. They're either in the book or they're not in the book. With respect to the nations and the kings of the earth who enter the holy city, the premise of Parry's argument is surely mistaken. He assumes that those referred to must be the same people who were consigned to the lake of fire at the end of chapter 20, because hitherto in Revelation these kings and nations are presented only in negative terms, as he puts it, the bad guys. However, this ironically overlooks an extremely important theological point and a major trajectory in the book of Revelation, namely the conversion of the nations through the suffering witness of the church. As Bauckham demonstrates, Revelation takes up and applies the most universalistic form of Jewish eschatological hope from the Old Testament that we see reflected in the Psalms and some of the prophets. And it declares how this will be fulfilled through the faithful witness of those who follow the Lamb. Put very simply, while some of the kings of the earth and the nations will certainly face God's wrath and end up in hell, not all will. Rather, some will repent and submit to the one who is king of the nations and ruler of the kings of the earth. I'm quoting there from the book of Revelation. The kings here in Revelation 21 are therefore those who respond positively to the exhortation expressed at the end of Psalm 2. They transfer their allegiance to God's anointed one. Likewise, the nations here are those who turn away from the darkness and come to the light of Zion. Isaiah 60, 1 to 3. And so walk in the light of the Lord, Isaiah 2, verse 5. But this is not something these kings or nations do after death. Rather, it's something they do during their lifetime, prior to the last day. Thus, rather than implying some kind of post-mortem exodus from hell, the focus on the nations in Revelation 15 and Revelation 21 mainly underscores the full realization of God's promise to Abraham. Genesis 12, verse 3, and the tremendous success of the church's mission, reflected in the social and the ethnic diversity of those who will comprise the New Jerusalem. The permanently open gates of the Holy City may thus indeed be a symbol of access as well as security, but only in the sense that these already converted kings and nations will likewise enjoy full access to God's presence and offer acceptable worship along with everyone else. Once again, it's worth recalling that this is figurative language and that its necessarily spatial imagery should probably not be pressed literally. In any case, there's no suggestion here in Revelation 21 of anyone in the lake of fire repenting or relocating to the holy city. In fact, the explicit reference to the book of life, chapter 21, verse 27, seems rather to rule out any such possibility for those who have been consigned to the lake of fire. 
Finally, a reference to first fruits may not necessarily imply a further harvest to come, although admittedly it normally does have such an association, and this is possibly so in Revelation 14, where the 144,000 are so described. However, the implied future harvest is most obviously that which is clearly depicted a few verses later in this very same chapter, verses 14 to 20. However we, clear, however we understand the details of this climactic harvest, in the context of Revelation, it clearly alludes to an event that will take place at the end of human history. There's certainly no suggestion here of a hypothetical harrowing of hell after a final judgment has taken place. Indeed, such an idea has really no explicit textual support anywhere, including John's depiction of the holy city in Revelation 21. Accordingly, it seems best to conclude that the New Jerusalem, the Bride of Christ, is comprised only of God's elect, those who have been redeemed through Jesus from every nation, tribe, people, and language. The New Eden. John concludes his description of the renovated cosmos with a New Eden. Technically, this is not really a separate entity from the city that has just been described. It's best understood in terms of the garden in which this city is located, akin to the temple garden of the original Eden. The allusions to the latter are obvious. A life-giving river, a fruit-bearing tree of life, and the presence of God himself. The Jewish hope of a return to paradise on earth is here realized, but in such a way that it incorporates the nations as well. Picking up the new temple imagery from Ezekiel 47, John describes a river that flows from God's throne, lined by life-sustaining trees, with leaves for the healing, says Ezekiel, but says John, for the healing of the nations. Such provision and healing emphasize the fullness of salvation that will be enjoyed in God's new creation. We'll be completely healed of sin and its effects. Idolatry will be totally eradicated, and we will serve only God and the Lamb. Consequently, there will be no more curse, likely referring here to the threat of destruction. The phrase echoes Zechariah 14, verse 11, where it's applied to the purified Jerusalem that would never again be threatened with the curse of destruction. Likewise, this new Eden will be entirely free of all that led to expulsion from the original paradise. So what we have here is not simply Eden restored, we have Eden perfected a place that will be perfect and where we will be fully devoted to the service of God and the Lamb, where we'll reign forever and ever, accomplishing the goal for which God has created us. Some of you are probably relieved to see no mention here of endless singing or perpetual harp playing. Admittedly, how exactly we will occupy our time in this new creation is not spelt out but I think we can safely rule out any possibility of perpetual boredom in a perfected physical realm filled with all the majesty and all the splendor of Almighty God. But in the light of all this, what do we make of that wonderful assurance in John 14? Just to go back there. That assurance that Jesus will come back and take us to be with himself. How does his father's house with its many rooms square with this terrestrial concept of heaven which we've just been considering? Well, for some, it doesn't really have to because Jesus is referring in John 14 to not the final state, but to the intermediate state. Tom Wright, for example, draws this conclusion on the basis of the noun mone, translated rooms or dwelling places in most modern English versions. He points out that this word was regularly used in ancient Greek for temporary lodgings rather than a final destination. However, while the noun can refer to a temporary resting place, it's not limited to this meaning. Indeed, just a few verses later, Jesus employs it in what is surely a non-temporary sense. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home, our mone, with them. Moreover, the cognate verb, meno, is used in both the immediate and the wider context to describe the enduring relationship between the Father and the Son, and the relationship of both Jesus and the Father to the disciples. So it's probably best not to infer the interim state simply from this particular Greek noun. 
Of course, some have read much more into this particular word due to its association with mansions in older English translations. In modern parlance, that speaks of large palatial structures, which is certainly not what William Tyndale nor King James translators intended. But unfortunately, some modern hymn writers, at least those of a previous generation, failed to realise that, and thus promoted a materialist dream of a celestial paradise. Take, for example, the familiar words of a 20th century hymn that's clearly inspired by John 14 as well as Revelation 21. I was going to sing it, but I'll not. <laughs> I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransomed will shine, I want a gold one that's silver lined. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we'll never more wonder, but walk on streets that are purest gold. A silver-lined gold mansion in the sky. I think we can safely conclude that this is not what Jesus was going to prepare for us. Rather, Jesus' claims are both more modest and more grandiose. More, more modest in the sense that Jesus is simply saying that there's plenty of room in his father's house. More grandiose in the sense that this residence we're going to is not our own personal space or property, but rather the very residence, the royal residence of God himself. Jesus is describing heaven here in terms of an extended household. As Kirstenberger points out, such a concept would have been very familiar in the first century. I quote, it was common in the culture of Jesus' day for many dwelling units to be combined to form an extended household. When a son would marry, it was customary for that son to add to his father's house so that the entire estate grew into a large compound. Understood in such a manner, he who goes to the father prepares a place there for those who belong to him. He establishes them as members of the father's household. He makes his home accessible to them as a final place of residence. And that's what he did at the cross. Jesus is therefore assuring his disciples here that he will make them, make us, part of God's extended household, guaranteeing us a future place in God's realm or abode. While that may presently be located in the heavenly realms, the allusion to the parousia in verse 3 would suggest that Jesus is actually speaking here of our final state, when God's dwelling is among his people and he will dwell with them and be their God. Nearly finished. So then, does this mean that Christians don't go to heaven when they die? Not necessarily. Even though the Bible never uses such language, several texts arguably suggest that we do go to be with Jesus when we die. Jesus promised that the dying thief would be with him that day in paradise. Paul's statements about being absent or away from the body and being present or being at home with the Lord. The images of the redeemed in God's heavenly abode in Hebrews and Revelation. But contrary to what several hymns misleadingly suggest, this will not, this will not be our eternal inheritance. Rather, this is simply a temporary abode while we wait for the new heaven and the new earth where righteousness dwells where we will live with God and God will live with us forever. However, despite what a few evangelicals today suggest, this is clearly an exclusive residence, one that God has prepared for and promised to those who love him. Moreover, it's accommodation that must be booked in advance. The idea of repentance in hell lacks any explicit biblical support. Moreover, there's no clear suggestion that post-mortem escape from hell is even possible, and much, much that seems to indicate otherwise. And so in answer to our question, is heaven the ultimate destination? I suppose we'd have to say it all depends. It depends on where you mean by heaven, and more importantly, it depends on who you think is going there. Well, by a clever and uh, often tried device, Paul has ensured that he's not going to be swamped with questions. I don't want to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have time for one or two. Before we 
Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, regarding the new creation, what do we risk if we um, hold to a destruction and replacement view of the new creation? So what does it risk if we hold to a uh, destruction view of, uh, uh, of, of the earth? Uh, I think the answer is uh, we risk saying God has failed. Uh, God has created the world. Uh, does he have to destroy it, obliterate it, and then start from scratch? That would suggest a failure on the part of God. Uh, I don't think God's going to fail. Thank you. We have a question at the back here. Yeah. Oh, and, and one here too. Oh. We'll go fr at the front first. Yep. Hi, Paul. Um, if I build a bridge now, will people get over it in heaven? <laughs> I'll certainly get over that question in heaven. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, really, the question is, what of this present creation will survive into the new creation? Uh, I think um, the answer, whatever answer I'm going to give, would be totally speculative. So I really don't know. Um. And a last question. Hi, Paul. Um, asking on behalf of someone in live stream. Um, if pre-fall Eden describes God's intent for humanity, being open, selfless, just relationship between everyone and God, how could God fail to achieve it if it did exceed it in heaven? There's a question about pre-fall Eden. Yeah, being and an open relationship between everyone and God. And its relation to the new heaven. Okay, if, if I understand myself correctly, more importantly, if I understand scripture correctly, my answer would be uh, that's exactly what God is going to achieve, only better. Uh, so. That sort of model of a perfect world that you get in Eden uh, is, I think, the biblical uh, prototype uh, or type of God's new creation, uh, where everything that was enjoyed in Eden uh, before the fall will be enjoyed in absolute perfection with no further risk of a fall. Well, will you join me with thanking Paul again?